All right, so 50 years of that really important landmark judgment and to understand its implications even further and why this is considered the shield or the guardian angel of Indian democracy. Who better to talk to than one of the country's top constitutional experts who's also been writing about this extensively in the papers, Arvind Datar. Arvind sir, thank you so much for joining us. Great as always speaking to you. So uh, I'm calling uh, K. Savan Bharti perhaps one of the most important uh, developments in and actually the history of independent India and the guardian of Indian democracy. Uh, would you like to elaborate on that? Why is it so important? Uh, you see, it is extremely significant because just as you take away oxygen, there's no human being left. You take away basic structures and nothing really left because then there is no limit to the amending power. We had to take, we had to go to the scenario before 73, before the judgment came. And the law was that parliament could amend any part of the constitution. I mean, parliament could take away the right to equality, could take away the right to free speech, your channel would not be here, it can take away right to life, and there'll be no remedy. And that's what the Supreme Court said, that parliament's power to amend the constitution is untrammeled. They can amend any part of the constitution. And it was actually in 1965, you know, what happened was that by uh, 1950 to 1965, the constitution was amended 17 times. And I know this closely because I wrote Courtroom Genius with Soli Sorabji. And I had the privilege of interviewing almost most of the people who did the Kesan Bharati case in 2000. Because I met late Justice Bhavi Chandra Chud. I met lawyers who briefed Palkiwala and yeah. so on. And what happened was they said you can amend it an unlimited power. Within 15 years, it amended the constitution 17 times. So then they asked a question that to what extent can parliament go? Is there some place beyond which parliament can't travel? And just as Mudolkar in 1965, he asked the interesting question. It's a very important question. He said that if you take away the right to life, right to liberty, right to equality, then are you amending the constitution or writing a new constitution? What is the use of a constitution without these rights? It's not a constitution at all for a republic democracy. And ironically, he used these basic features and he said, where are these basic features? And he said, look at our preamble. We give the people of India liberty, equality, fraternity, social justice. This is the, these are the basic features. That's what Mudolkar said. And then it was subsequently amplified in the Kesan Bharati case. And why Kesan Bharati came was, Golaknath went to an extreme. They said, parliament can't amend at all. Yeah. So between one saying that parliament can amend anything, one end of the spectrum saying parliament cannot amend, you have to find a via media. So let us understand that more. Because of Keshavan and Bharti, it essentially means that parliament, for example, cannot just say, oh, we're going to do away with elections. Parliament cannot say we're going to do away with the right to life. It can't just say we're going to arrest you and throw you into prison forever without any due process. Any government, no matter how big a majority it has, even if tomorrow a government comes with a 500-seat majority, they can't do these things. They can't say we're doing away with elections and all of that because of this one judgment that was passed 50 years ago. They can't. They can't. They can't. And uh, they, they can't, for example, take away right to life and liberty. They can't say right to equality. They can't, they can't say India will not be federalist in nature. They can't say India will not be secular. So over the years, basic structure has been taken up and they can't take away right to judicial review. Like in the uh, anti-defection case, the Kyoto Holon, they said that the decision of the speaker could decide and no court could have judicial review. So judicial review is essential. They can't take away Article 226. The writ petition cannot be taken away. Mr. Dattari, this, this is such an obvious thing that you have to wonder why 50 years ago it was as divided 7-6. Uh, some of these things um, should have been fairly obvious. Why did, the judge, why did six of the judges feel at that time it's okay for parliament to have the right to override everything? Actually, if you read the minority judgment, sometimes you feel a sense of amazement and wonderment. They really felt, and they wrote down that saying that, uh, they said that, you know, you can't have a doomsday scenario. We can't think of parliament which will take away people's right. We can't think that parliament will act against the people. So they really thought that there'll be a benign parliament and always parliament which will do good to people. And therefore, there's no need for basic structure. And they, also, and they also went by what's called a literalist interpretation. They said Article 360 says Parliament can amend the Constitution. No fetters are placed on that. So who is the judiciary to put some conditions on that? You see, And actually, I've been speaking at some seminars. I say it's not 7 is to 6. It's 6.6 .6 to 6.4. Because this is Khanna argued with the minority all the way except on basic structure. So only in that 
one cow out, I think it's para 14, 26 of the judgment, where he says, no, no, you, you can't, beyond a point, you can't do it. Because then once you take away the essential features, then the whole structure of the constitution is altered. That he says you can't do. Look, it's not still exactly codified. It is, I mean, for example, I've heard some people saying it's not crystal clear what, for example, could come under basic structure. Uh, even in the Constitution, it's not crystal clear. Freedom of speech, it does have some caveats. Um, so, for example, when it says subject to friendly relations with foreign countries, what does that mean? Should you not say something crit critical of China? So, without the basic structure being formally codified in some way, is it still up for debate? What is basic structure and what is not? Uh, not really. You see, some, some of the great principles of constitutional law are not defined. What do you mean by due process of law? The entire American constitution has got the due process. Due process is not defined. You take basic structure. And according to me, if a basic structure was rigidly defined, it would be weakened. Because the very fact that it is flexible, it is malleable, it, it is meant for generations to come. So what is basic tomorrow may not be basic today, you see. Or what is basic today may not be basic tomorrow. So it, it allows a flexibility, a malleability to basic structure. The core is the same. But now, for example, whether it's 2023 or 2050, nobody can say that Mr. X can't practice, or all people have only one religion. Nobody can practice religion, or there'll be no free and fair elections. So these are all eternal principles. And it's not correct. This is a wrong criticism to say that basic structure is not uh, this. Is. Now, by means of judgments, you can say eight or ten items are part of basic structure. So this, like you said, like you mentioned, secularism, federalism, free and fair elections, right to equality, right to life, these are all going to be eternal values. But Mr. Dathar, with all of these safeguards in place, there still seems to be a sense that over the years and the decades, whether it is the central government, whether it is the state governments, whether it is district magistrates, there's still a feeling that the rights of individuals, fundamental rights, basic freedoms can and often are trampled upon. We've heard of people being in jail for years altogether without getting a trial. Look at the number of under trials who are there. The entire question of bail. Some people are given bail, some people are not. They're denied bail and they're kept in prison forever. So despite whatever may have been said on the basic structure in case of an Anthati, it does appear that governments often still can find a way to trample on individual rights, basic structure or no basic structure. How can that be dealt with? No, you see, now the point is the basic structure is part of the constitution, what parliament can do. Basic structure basically says it's a, a restriction or a, like, let's say it's a dike, right? It's a barrier on what parliament can do. Now, suppose, for example, a person doesn't get bail. Now, that is the fault of the Indian Penal Code, the CRPC and so on, that the person, now why, why are this out of 6 lakh people, some 80% are under trials? Why should a person be under trial? Because he can't furnish a bail bond. Then you'll have to have a condition where the Supreme Court can say the office is petty, then there's no need for a bail bond. So that can be done by the judiciary. Now, the fact that people are in jail or freedoms are trampled upon, may be something which the judiciary has to address and the legislature has to address. Why do you have white powers of arrest? Why do you have a UAPA law which says that I can't get bail until I can show that I've got a very good chance of success? Now, this law to have been struck down. Unfortunately, Supreme Court upheld it in some laws. You know, so that that I think we can use basic structure to strike down these laws. Also, in my opinion, the judiciary can go a few steps further and say, no, this can't be done. It's a shock that, as you rightly put it, there are five lakh under trials languishing for no reason. And most of them are very poor and marginalized people. That's the sad state of affairs. There's nobody to give a bail bond, nobody to stand surety. So at the end of the day, you still believe that 50 years later, that judgment that was passed in 1973 with that wafer thin margin is today the biggest and the greatest shield that Indian democracy potentially has to protect itself from something that could turn us into an autocracy at some stage. Yes, and it, it is a shield, it's a bulwark, it's a complete protection that tomorrow, even if a government has 90% majority in parliament, they still cannot take away our basic rights. Even if they've got 99% majority, they can't still take it away. And, and of course, if that verdict had gone the other way, uh, what do you feel? Would we have still been a democracy today in the full sense of the word or somewhere along the way could some of our freedoms have been eroded? Actually, in my article in the Indian Express today, uh, when the review came up, you know, they wanted to review the basic structure. So, apart then this whole thing came that nobody asked for a review, you know. 
then justice beg said you know see basic structure is not defined i don't know what's the basic structure so should we not have the review so that we can finalize it so palkia respond saying that he says i never thought that we'll come to a stage where the supreme court can't understand its own judgment we all know what is basic structure and then in the final murtaza fazal ali in the review says why are you opposing the review suppose you had lost case in bharati and if you had asked for a review will the union be justified in opposing it suppose you had lost case in bharati would you not ask for a review today government has lost they are asking for a review so what's wrong and palkewala's reply is extremely important he says and i'll quote his exact words he says without a trace of flippancy my lord if we had lost case in bharati there would be no supreme court before which i could argue arvind atar thank you so much for joining us and why that was such an important judgment 50 years ago thank you so much for being with us